Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Today, my guest is Jay Rustin, and if you're not familiar with Jay, Jay is a producer and mixer, originally from Canada, now living in LA, and he's worked with a lot of major artists such as Anthrax, Steel Panther, Diana Ross, Wilson Phillips, Stone Sour, Meatloaf, Better Than Ezra. The list just goes on and on and on, and Jay makes a ton of great sounding records, so really excited to have him on the show today. And in this interview, we talk a lot about his process and how he goes about about making rock records that sound organic. And sometimes when I hear the word organic, my mind immediately thinks like little processing and very like stripped down, that kind of thing. But Jay's records aren't aren't quite that way. Jay's records sound like modern records, but they have this organic feel to them. And as you'll hear in this conversation, you know, the way he approaches tracking really has a lot of impact on how these records get that organic, natural sounding feel. And in this interview, he definitely shares a lot of his tips for recording, as well as how he tackles his mixing process and mixing vocals and a whole bunch of other great stuff. So I think you're going to find this episode really, really interesting. So let's just jump right into it. Jay Rustin, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. For people who might not know you and your background and how you got into music and all the cool stuff that you're working on, can you give us that story? Yeah, it's um, somewhat lengthy. <laughs> Basically, in the early 90s, I was playing music and I was in bands in southern Ontario, Canada, you know, Detroit area, Toronto, just, you know, doing sh- random shows and stuff, not anything too, too serious. And I discovered that in London, Ontario, there was a recording school, which, you know, at that time was pretty much non-existent in most of Canada. There was maybe one other school that actually had a proper studio. I think it was in Montreal. And I decided to check it out, and I applied to get in, and I was turned down. And it was a pretty tough school to get into because there was a pretty limited amount of people they could take, and you know, lots of people want to learn how to be record producers and engineers. So I tried again the following year, and I got in, and uh, the one of the production teachers was Jack Richardson, who produced the Guess Who, American Woman. You know, he produced Alice Cooper. He discovered Bob Ezrin. He was uh, my production teacher, and his son Garth is also a very successful producer. He did Rage Against the Machine and Mudvayne and hundreds of other bands. Was it Fanshawe that you went to? Yeah, yeah, Fanshawe. College. I'm also a Fanshawe grad as well. So, and, nice. I, and and I learned from Jack as well. So, yeah, of course very familiar with it. (laughs) So, you know, having spent a lot of time with Jack and meeting Garth and Bob Ezrin was a really amazing experience and just really got me into wanting to be like them. And uh, after I finished Fanshawe, I moved to Ottawa, strangely enough, not the music mecca of the world, (laughs) but uh, I had an opportunity there with a producer named Leslie Howe, who discovered Alanis Morissette and did her two Canadian dance pop records. And he had had a pop band named One to One that was popular in Canada as well. So I started working under him, and Alanis was kind of had just left and moved to the United States and was already in LA, pro- presumably working on Jagged Little Pill or finishing it. You know, n- none of us really knowing that at the time. And uh, so I was learning a lot just working with local Ottawa bands and learning under Leslie. It was a really great experience. And then, you know, Jagged Little Pill came out and just exploded and it brought a lot of attention to the studio and and to Ottawa, which was interesting and kind of cool. And so we got a few interesting acts that came through and I just, I knew I wanted more and it was just really tough there to work with bands on an international level. So I always kind of had my sights set on either Toronto, Vancouver, or L.A. I even looked at New York. I looked at all kinds of different places. And Leslie, at that time, moved to L.A. and built a studio in Studio City. And he asked me if I wanted to come down and work for him down there rather than stay in Ottawa. And this was around 2002. So after about seven years in Ottawa, I moved to L.A. and pretty much started over again, which is sort of what you have to do when you change cities. So I started working at his studio and pretty much right away 
really interesting clients were coming in. I started working with Desmond Child, who you know, written with and produced with Aerosmith and Bon Jovi and Ricky Martin. And uh, I started doing records with Peter Asher, who used to run Apple Records for the Beatles, and he produced and discovered James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt. So I was working with some heavy hitters and having to up my game substantially very quickly, realizing I really knew nothing after all those years, you know, slugging it out with indie bands. And, you know, I had the engineering part down and just I could work very quickly, but like producing vocals and making songs special and making them hits, I just clearly I was clueless. So when you learn from the greats, you realize very quickly you don't know anything. (laughs) So it was sort of a learning experience there. And uh, after about three years of doing that, I decided to build my own studio in uh, Los Angeles and I built a mix room, which I'm still sitting in. It's been about 15 years now or 16 years. And I just started producing bands on my own and I got introduced to a comedy act called Steel Panther and I did all of their records, which led to a bunch of other rock and metal bands as well. So that's kind of like the long road to how I ended up producing a lot of rock and metal bands. But on the flip side, working with guys like Peter Asher, I made an opera record, I did um, a country record, I did stuff with Raul Malo from the Mavericks, who's a country singer, but we did more of like an easy listening record. I did a Diana Ross record. Um, I remixed a Better Than Ezra record in Surround Sound. So I try to keep my style very um, diverse. I didn't want to just do rock and metal and still don't. You know, I'm about to go into the studio with Air Supply next month. um, And I just finished a Swedish death metal record. So I am sort of all over the place, which I really, really like to do. That's awesome. Do you like that diversity just because it keeps you and like it keeps you fresh with like just just for your ears sake and like listening to different things? Or is it that you like working in different genres for the sake of learning how different productions work in different styles? I think it's just it's helpful to do both because I can apply the same skills to a pop record than I can to a metal record. And you know, working those years with Desmond Child doing demos and stuff. And, you know, we would we worked with Katy Perry before she was famous, trying to figure out what her sound was going to be. And we were kind of doing like an Adele thing with her piano, big vocals. And, you know, clearly the label went a different direction. But, you know, those experiences and producing vocals and spending, you know, eight hours on a lead vocal and then stacking 40 harmonies, I can then apply that skill to making a metal record. And teach a metal singer, okay, look, if you do it like this, which is basically the Mutt Lang approach, really, you know, with vocals, the way he would uh, approach Def Leppard or the Cars, just stack, 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 and create a very unique vocal sound. So I do like that kind of classic production, but I also like minimalist stuff, too. And, you know, I like to record bands that can just play live and minimal overdubs, and you don't have to replace everything. And so I, that's why I like to be so diverse, because... If you make a very technical record where everything's perfect and stacked and sampled and replaced and tuned and all that stuff, then the next thing I want to do is go into a room with four people who can just play their instruments and bash out a record in two days. Fair. Yeah, it makes sense. That's interesting that you were talking about stacking vocals and how, like, you know, you really got kind of the... uh, you got like the master class in learning how, how to stack vocals and work on those big pop productions, working with Desmond Child stacking vocals is something that I find a lot of people uh, tend to have issues with because they just don't know like maybe where to start. They may have a lead melody, but they don't necessarily know kind of where to look beyond that. So as far as coming up with vocal ideas, are there any recommendations you would have as as far as like good starting points? I think you have to have an ear for music. First of all, you know, I'm a musician. I played bass. I played horns. I played in bands. I have very good relative pitch. I know when stuff's out of tune immediately, but I'm not a... I, my theory isn't great. I sort of my one regret was I should have learned how to play piano. I should have, you know, really focused more on music theory because I do find all those things helpful in the studio. And when I've recorded orchestras, you know, I can follow the lead sheet. I can follow the music. If the conductor is like, okay, let's go to bar forty six, you know, I can figure out, you know, if he's talking tech, musical technical theory. But you know, it, those kind of things can be helpful. But just having an ear for pitch and hearing harmonies quickly is a great skill and that can be learned and I work on that a lot but a lot of times just the singers have that ability which is helpful and if they don't then it can become a challenge and then you 
a lot of producers I work with will just create fake harmonies with tuning software and then teach those to the singer. Or they'll just use the fake harmonies, which blows my mind as well, instead of having them sing it. Um, and a lot of, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when I was recording pop music and doing, you know, 30 tracks of vocals, we would have to align all that stuff by hand in Pro Tools and make sure consonants were lined up. And then, of course, Vocal Line showed up and Re Revoice Pro and all these things that are just mind-blowing technically what you can do with those uh, programs, which I don't really get into too much because I just don't do that kind of production anymore. But it's... It is crazy what you are able to do with that. So I think those can be helpful for a lot of people that are trying to be efficient and track a lot of stuff and make it all line up and be tight because I am guarantee you every pop record you hear on the radio right now is heavily manipulated with plugins and editing software rather than a human you know, doing it over and over and over again. I mean, they still have to sing it, but it's very quickly tuned, tidied, synced, locked up, revoice proed, whatever, and you know, probably saves them days. Totally. Yeah. Some people even just sing with the auto tune right away. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't done that yet, but I feel like that would just be like a bit of a nightmare if, if you get someone that's off. Right. Because auto tune can be so unpredictable sometimes. Yeah. I'd rather just push them to sing it more, which is, you know, my thing. I just get great vocals out of people by pushing them. And, you know, by the end, they're exhausted. And but we have great stuff to choose from. And the least amount of tuning and editing is required. For sure. It's interesting that you were talking about, like, how you'll push them to the point where sometimes they are exhausted. Like I, there's, I always hear so many other producers say like, you know, avoid that at all costs. And like, it's, it's a horrible thing to do, but like, I'm, I'm kind of with you. It's like, I'd rather know that like they're doing it for themselves and not artificially. And I, I feel like the singers like to know that as well. Right. Rather than just oh, like, yeah. I mean, most of the singers I work with, if I, I usually have this conversation with them ahead of time, say, look, you know, I don't enjoy auto-tuning. I don't enjoy editing. It's not a fun part of the process. I'm sure you don't want to know that your vocals were heavily manipulated. So if you're on the same page as me and you want to just get this amazing and nail it and just have the best performance possible, then it's going to take some time and real effort. And usually they're always like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's just do it, you know? I, I, I rarely get any blowback unless they're starting to suffer vocally or having issues, you know, then of course that's understandable. But if I have a singer that is just pure lazy about it, then I probably wouldn't be working with them. Fair. Yeah, that's true. And I'm sure, you know, at the level of artists that you're working with, those people have chosen to make music their career. So they've, you know, they've definitely realize that they have to push themselves. They have to learn to like be masters of their craft. They can't just wing it and, and hope that it translates live somehow, you know? <laughs> it's different with younger artists because they grew up at home, garage band, logic, whatever, just doing it automatically. Oh, well, I just sing it once and tune it and comp it and, or, you know, edit it, whatever. They're used to doing it the least amount of times possible. So you might get some blowback on a much younger artist who's had some experience recording themselves because they're like, well, why, why would I sing it 30 times when two or three times will do and I'll just tune it. And, you know, then I have a more big picture discussion about, you know, there might, it might be a subtle difference between singing it five or six more times to get it really great. So you don't have to tune it. The listener might not even notice it, but subconsciously, I think people know when something's just better rather than been fixed. You know, I think the listener is educated enough to know generally. Yeah, there's like a feeling that you get from it when something is amazing and the performance is amazing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Um, I'd love to go back a little bit. You were talking earlier about uh, going to Fanshawe and learning from Jack. And like I, I had the luxury of or the, the privilege of learning from Jack as well. And, and he's just such an amazing guy and taught me so many lessons. And I'm curious. And we've, I've even had Garth on the podcast before, too. And Garth obviously learned a lot from his dad, too, and shared some of those on his episode. But I'd love to know, like, what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned from working with Jack? Um, really simple stuff, you know, make copies of everything you know always keep copies of the masters because someday somebody's going to come knocking record labels managers bands we can't find our record do you have a copy it's already happened to me multiple times over the years so that was a big one um making make sure you're just rolling and recording right away as quickly as possible if, especially if musicians are noodling around and starting to play in the, in the room. So I like to get great sounds and spend as much time setting up. But if people are itching to go and it's a session where it's live playing and 
you know, people can play, then I just get it rolling as quickly as possible and sort of tweak on the fly. Every record's different, of course, if you're just doing piecemeal and one instrument at a time, and then, you know, obviously that's a different scenario. But And I think just general attitude in the studio, being in charge, letting them know, you know, that you're in command of the session, I think it gives people confidence in what you're doing. And you walk in that room and you just start guiding people immediately. And I think that he was really good at that. And that's how he got results. Totally. I 100% agree with all of that. And that was that was my impression of Jack, too. It was like Jack was very, um, very business centric, but like always with like the customer experience in mind. You know, it was like, how do I make this easier for everyone and just make it so that the artist doesn't have to think all they have to do is come in and perform and you know, just give it their best and, and not have to worry about all this other technical stuff that they don't care about, you know, just, he, he was, he was always that kind of guy. Well, exactly. It's just, it's from a different era too. And, you know, I was, I'm just old enough where I made records on tape on analog boards with a couple assistants and guitar techs and drum techs. And there was a job for everybody and there was budget to do it. And now that's all changed. And that delegation of jobs to you know, somebody's good at this and somebody's good at that. That's changing so much. And nowadays you have somebody that's co-written the song, engineered it, produced it, mixed it, and sometimes even co-managing the band. I mean, it's just crazy how many hats people are wearing. And, you know, I do three jobs, produce, engineer, mix. I have engineers I like to use if the budget's available. Of course, I have things I farm out to people. Absolutely. But the budget just isn't there all the time, especially with rock and roll and metal. You know, we're on micro budgets compared to, you know, pop music and country and all kinds of other genres. So, you know, it's sort of another reason why genre genre jump as well is just it's nice to have the luxury of a budget once in a while with an artist that is not in the rock and metal world. And it's a little more relaxing and less stressful when, you know, <laughs> You don't have to be constantly worrying about every cent that's being eaten up by studio time or travel, whatever. So it's nice sometimes to have projects that have a more open budget. Fair, definitely. Yeah, you need you need that just to, you know, obviously pay the bill sometimes and just to have that uh, just that that padding and, and make of making your sessions go smoother sometimes. Right? Well, not all rock and metal is budget squeeze. You know, there's lots of bands I work with that get really good budgets. But again, it depends what label they're on some self-fund, um, a lot of things affect it, where they're located, you know, what country, because then you have to think about exchange rates, all kinds of things affect it. So it re- it's very artist and label dependent. For sure. You had mentioned earlier that you made that change from Ottawa to LA and that just changing locations in itself is, is it's going to impact your work. And like you said, you're kind of starting over there in a lot of ways. And I've heard you mention in other interviews that when you first moved to LA, you were just trying to get your foot in the door as much as possible. And one of the ways that you were doing that was you were going to clubs and kind of finding bands to work with and maybe even offering to record them for free. And I'm curious to know, you know, is that something that for people that are maybe working in smaller cities or, or just getting started with their career right now, like, is that, is that kind of the path that you still see being a viable path to, to get your foot in the door? 100%. And I can absolutely tell you that the reason I started working with bigger, well known bands is because some of the unknown bands I worked with that I went and found and recorded for free or really on the cheap introduced me to those bands. And there was a band in particular here in LA called 10 Speed that were signed to AM and that kind of folded and they basically lost their deal. But I started working with them and the drummer was playing in two or three other bands as so many musicians in LA have to do. And he introduced me to the Steel Panther guys. And that's just sort of led me on a path of many, many rock and metal records. So, you know, I have a lot of people to thank for those kind of introductions, but if I hadn't been doing that, then that never would have happened. Like some people are just like, no, they, I got to be paid for everything. And, you know, it's not just going to show up on your doorstep, especially when you're unknown. And I felt like I had the skills and I could deliver quality sounding records. So I just started knocking out a couple songs with a bunch of different artists and some paid off and some didn't. So of course there's a risk, but I can tell you right now, a lot of the newer, younger hard rock and metal bands 
are working on their own records with their buddies in their towns and their cities and that's what's getting put out they're not then the label isn't stepping in and firing the guy or the girl who's making the record and bringing in the big shot the budget's not there to do that anymore they're basically saying oh you made your record already with your buddy in your town it sounds great then we're just going to put it out so i think more than ever it's actually important to make those relationships with the bands in your town in your city because it could then catapult you to the next level and some of those producer engineer songwriter people are now reaping those rewards if if that one band they started with became successful for sure i i feel like there's i i agree with all of that and i think that sometimes the fear of working for free is that you know, it's not going to amass to anything or that you're going to get taken advantage of and that kind of thing. So do you have any advice for people who are maybe considering working for free? Like, did you ever have any sort of conditions behind working for free with some of these bands? Like as far as, you know, maybe how many songs you would offer them or that that kind of thing? Look, working for free is always going to be risky because somebody's going to take advantage of you and you have to know when to draw the line. And I always find if the artist and I had the same vision, they were usually very appreciative of the situation and it wasn't like totally free some you know they'd have to pay for studio time or they'd shoot me a couple hundred bucks if they had it you know it just it depended on the situation and i would usually limit it you know let's just do two songs or let's do three songs or let's do one song and just see how it goes and then oftentimes they would then go find the money oh we got a budget or we're going to do this small deal and you know we got money to do five songs now and it would pay off so you just have to assess the risk and is this artist worth it? And of course we would always do silly little deal memos, you know, Oh, if you get signed, you pay me this much. And those never panned out to anything because, you know, (laughs) 99% of the time, nothing ever happens. The band doesn't go anywhere or it doesn't sell or whatever. And, you know, this is still, when I was doing that, we were in the, I mean, streaming didn't exist. People were stealing music. Basically it was, the height of Napster and all that, you know, early to mid 2000s. But there was a couple artists that I worked with that were, had publishing deals and we basically knocked out a few songs and my deal with with, with them was, look, if you get a record deal uh, from these demos, then, then pay me. And it worked out a couple times where I actually got paid, one of which I had to go to court and get legally paid (laughs) because they decided not to pay me after they got a deal. But that just happens too. So you have to be willing to take those risks. But like you said, like you at least signed those memos. So you covered your ass by doing that and, you know, tried to. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. And and that's something I think a lot of people are afraid to even like bring up that topic of like, let's sign a deal, you know, or like, let's make a contract early on, especially in someone's career. Like people are, afraid that like if they if they talk about that that they're going to scare off the clients or whatever and it's like well if you were working with them for free anyway you're not really losing anything sure (laughs) everything's changed now anyway you have email proof you have a chain of of communication hopefully that where people have spoken about what they've agreed upon and if it's a phone conversation i'll always follow it up with an email restating the facts of what we spoke about on the phone what we agreed upon and I think that's always a good thing to do. A friend of mine actually invented an app called Pinky Swear. And you both go in the app, you put in what you agree to, and you pinky swear, basically, that that's what you're going to do. <laughs> so I, I hope it takes off for him because I think that's really brilliant, you know, for stuff like that. And, you know, look, contracts are worth the piece of paper they're written on, basically. So it's whoever has the money to go to court or not. And unfortunately, that's the reality in some of those situations. But l- luckily I haven't been in that situation very often. Um, everybody I've worked with has been pretty straight up about everything. So been very lucky. Yeah. A contract is something that like you, you ho- hope that you never really need to access it, but when, when you need it, it, it comes in handy. So, yeah, I mean, I'm chasing some royalties right now for, uh, with a label that's just, you know, I don't know what's going on. It's either been lost in the shuffle or, Somebody's choosing not to pay. I don't know. We'll find out eventually, but that's what <laughs> lawyers are for, and that's what you pay them for. For sure. <laughs> well, obviously, the, the free side of things worked out for you, and, and like you said, like just that one connection with the the guy from Steel Panther, or what became Steel Panther, like that obviously was a, a great connection to make and has definitely helped your career and, and 
led to so many other projects. I'd love to talk about working with Steel Panther because I love that band and I just think they're so much fun and love the music. Uh, what, what's it like working with those guys? It's interesting. You know, I see the singer almost every day. He's He lives really close to me. We go hiking every morning. It's kind of our exercise, clear our brain. We go up, you know, there's a lot of hills in LA, so we hike up the hills and so I literally just saw him about an hour ago and we chat about life and everything. And it's just, we have a very close working and friendship. So that's helpful. Um, the other guys don't live near me, so it's not, I don't see or talk to them as much. So it's, you know, when we get together, it's always super fun, but you know, we've made a lot of records together and the, this latest record that they just finished is the first one I have not produced. They decided to self produce it and I just mixed it. So that was a different experience for sure. And, um, but it was easy, you know, they, they did a good job and hired a good engineer to track stuff. So, and I think it was just something they wanted to do and they needed to do, which I totally encourage because if you work with the same person over and over again, I think everybody gets a little too comfortable with each other. So each time I go back into a record with an artist I've already worked with, and I do have a lot of multiple return clients, it's, always tough to keep that fresh so i think it was actually good for them to do this and i they realized how difficult it is to make a record um when there isn't somebody steering the ship because they're doing it and uh so i may have heard some yeah we're not doing that again conversations we'll see (laughs) (laughs) but they did it it turned out really good it sounds great we just got it mastered by paul logos so everybody's stoked so that's awesome that'll come out in a few months everything takes forever now because of vinyl i'm i'm delivering six to ten months in advance now which is just obscene but that's just where we're at it's wild that that's the the landscape we're in these days especially with the vinyl stuff like crazy crazy waits for that kind of stuff yeah i know and it's it's too bad because you the digital version can be ready literally 48 hours before it needs to be uploaded So oftentimes the digital version and the vinyl are different mixes, different mastering. I've made changes to records three months after the vinyl lacquer was cut. You know, that just that's just the reality now. Speaking of Steel Panther, like I'm curious to know, like with that band, they I mean, they are obviously influenced by decades earlier of music, you know, and they have a lot of that kind of throwback sound. And I'm curious to know, like when you're working with their their kind of songs, do you ever feel like it's like a challenge to find the balance of kind of getting the sounds from those older decades versus like a more modern sound? I don't really think about it, to be honest. You know, I think the music just lends itself to sounding the way it sounds. It. I always I have a saying that I stole from somebody about 20 years ago called trust the process and meaning just that when you make a record it's a process everybody has a job to do everybody's going to be good at their job and trying their best so trust that process and making the first record especially my i just i had a rule of no rules you know there were first of all it's a comedy record through and through it's supposed to be funny but they're also incredible musicians so let's make the music awesome and let's make it tight and yeah, let's have crazy wild guitar solos, too much finger tapping, too much whammy bar, whatever. That's to me, adds to the comedy aspect of it. Oh, like every song has like crazy guitar work and silly background vocals and a David Lee Ross scream every four bars. Why not? You know, <laughs> and I think it really added to it. But it was hard to keep that up over the course of each record because you get pressure from people. Oh, you should be more serious, or why do you, why don't you guys make a serious record? Well, we're they're a comedy band. <laughs> like it's it's still a band. It's still a great rock band, but it's also supposed to be funny. So it's always a challenge to make each record, make it funny, make it the songs great. You know, for them as a band and songwriters, it's a huge challenge. Uh, especially on the guitar player, Russ, he's not the sole writer, but for the most part, in the last few records, he's written pretty much every note. A couple of the fir- the first two records, uh, the singer wrote some of the songs as well. Um, so it's just, it's such a, you would think that it's a super fun, easy record to make, which it can be, and it, it was often, but it was also extremely challenging. You know, we, the five of us would sit in this room agonizing over lyrics what's funnier uh you know 
what lyric is funnier? How do we make this line wittier? Can we do it with swearing less or being less graphic? You know, there was a lot of those kind of conversations. And so, and everybody's got different ideas and thoughts about how that should go. So it's, I find those records really amazing and fun, but also really challenging. Totally. Well, yeah, because it's not just like your standard record. I mean, I guess to some degree, you know, worrying about vocals and, and lyrics, like that applies no matter what genre you're in. But comedy adds a whole other element to it as far as like, you know, understanding what people find funny. And well, exactly. And lyrically, I would stay away from most artists lyrics because that's their baby. You know, if I don't tell Corey Taylor to change a lyric, I don't tell the singer from Avatar to change a lyric. I don't tell Scott Ian to write a new lyric. It's just they write their lyrics. They know what they're trying to say. That's that's not my business. That's just my personal thing as a producer. Unless a lyric is really bad or just rubbing me the wrong way or I think a word. Sure, of course I'm going to make those suggestions. But generally I would avoid messing with the art. Vocal melodies, that's a totally different story. All right, let's make this catchier. That melody could be better. That can move this way better. But with the Steel Panther records, I think it was a lot more important to make sure because you're basically trying to make a comedy record and a music record. So you're, it's a lot different. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree with you about, you know, not trying to rewrite someone else's lyrics, especially because if it's like a personal story or that kind of thing, like, you know, you're not going to make someone feel like shit because you, you, sh- you don't like their, their story that they went through, you know, and change up their lyrics, you know, sure. like, well, a lot of producers get heavily involved in songwriting, and I don't. I'm more, I get involved in arrangement. I have done a little bit of co writing, but I try and choose artists that don't need co writing. And if they do, they've usually written with a songwriter they know or has been recommended to them before they've even gotten to me. So, you know, it's just not necessarily my focus. For sure. So then in the end, if you're, you know, working with these bands on their on their music and the arrangement and and maybe staying away from the lyrics, that kind of stuff, I guess as a full package, like in your opinion, what ultimately makes a good song? I look at melody the most. Most bands can write cool music, you know, great riffs, um, especially heavier bands. You know, there's no shortage of great music lyrics. As I said, that's a very personal thing. I don't pay attention to them as much. Melody is everything. The vocal melody is what 99% of the audience is noticing and listening to with the lyrics. That's my focus, the vocals. It, it, anybody can record a band to make them sound great, but to produce great vocals and if you're trying to get on the radio, the song needs to be a hit. You know, it's just, there's really no way around that. So making that happen is the challenge and guiding a singer to sing a great vocal that's going to captivate hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. That's the, that's my focus really. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that is the message that people attach themselves to with, with these songs, right? It's like the thing that they're singing, which is why I don't go after lyrics because especially if it's an established band, most likely their fans are already really into their lyrics. So you know, I'm not going, I'm not going there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I worked with Coheed and Cambria. Claudio's brilliant. He's got his fan base. They know exactly what he's up to, his storylines and everything. That just, that's his thing. And I have no business touching that. So I just, I, I know where my boundaries are. For sure. I guess, I guess that can maybe become a little bit problematic when you're working with like a legacy act who's had a lot of records and maybe they are kind of shifting their direction a little bit, then, you know, maybe then it's kind of a matter of, I guess, consulting with the artist to see like what their vision is for it. Are they trying to make that legacy record again? Or are they trying to, are they trying to do something new on purpose? And, and sure. And a lot of them, that's their goal is to do something new, which is great, but you know, they're still the same person and they're always going to have a similar style to what they did. So if they try and veer too differently, then I think the fan base sees that right away. For sure. Definitely. Um, well, an- another thing that I wanted to ask you about that I've heard you say in interviews is that you generally love to record bands live and that you also prefer not to use click tracks. Is that, is that true? Yeah. It's not that I prefer not to, it's just, I don't have to, it doesn't really matter if, the, if they can play. 
and I generally don't record anybody these days that can't play, so that's good. <laughs> um, you know, of course, in my younger years, I recorded whatever walked in the door, and I often would encounter a really good band that had a really bad drummer, which was always a huge challenge. Or the other way around, you'd have a killer drummer, and everybody else was like, eh. So that was a lot easier to deal with because you get a great drum track, you have a killer foundation, and then you could literally spend, you know, bar after bar. Even working on tape, I would you know record stuff a bar or two at a time sometimes if I needed to, to get things tight. But yeah, it's uh, if a band can play and their timing is great, I will absolutely record the drummer and the bass player live with the guitar players too, but you know maybe overdub the guitars later with no click. And if we get the take we like or multiple takes we like, I'll comp together a take of the whole band. Then I'll make a click track to their tempo. So at least I have a click. So then when I go to do overdubs, I have a click track, I have a tempo map, I can add MIDI, I can add keyboards, I can add loops, I can time compress vocals if I need to. Say I have a bunch of harmonies and we want to just use them on every chorus. Well, then I just put them into, you know, time stretch mode in Pro Tools and I can drop, you know, the the harmonies on each chorus and they just stretch and squeeze to the each tempo of each section it's brilliant it works great and i just find it really it's just an easier way to make a record than to try and conform a drummer to every bar being perfect to a, a set click if his meter is really good and he's just slowly moving in and out of tempo no one's gonna hear that so this, I, that's why I just make the click to the band. I did not this newest Avatar record, but the previous one I did, we did on tape, and we did some with click, some without, fully live. Both guitars, bass, and drums. Kept everything. The only thing we overdubbed was solos and vocals. So that was a huge challenge to make, especially for them. They rehearsed eight hours a day for six weeks um, in Sweden before, and then they came to Burbank and we recorded here. This newest record we did similarly, um, it doesn't come out till next year, but we tracked live, kept the bass and drums, used some click, some not click. Even the songs with click, I redid the tempo map to his tempo. So, you know, even though he played to click, he's not perfectly on the click, no drummer is, so I just slightly adjusted the click to him, so that if I wanted to copy and paste stuff or any sort of MIDI stuff, it was tight to him rather than making him tight to the click. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I was curious about, you know, when you're not recording with the click, obviously editing can then become a challenge, but it sounds like the way you're doing it, it, it isn't because you've got that tempo map there. I think editing's way easier without click because then I just go kick drum to kick drum, basically. If you're editing with click, Say bar 26, he's right on the click, but bar 42, he's slightly pushing. Well, then when you go to edit it together or move stuff around, things don't line up. You know, s something might be pushed and the previous bar he's sort of dragging. But when you have no click, you literally just go, okay, well, the bar one of this to bar one of that, just edit kick drum to kick drum. Use, their, use the bass drums as the bar marker, basically. And... It's so much smoother and so much faster, and then I just go into shuffle mode and, you know, hack it all together, get a great take. And usually with a good band that can play, it's only about five or six major edits. Like, you know, maybe each section might be a different take, or the whole take is mostly one one take, or the whole song, I should say, is mostly one take, and maybe I grab the bridge from another one or replace the chorus from another one, and that's it. And then, then I just rebuild the tempo map. That makes sense. So you're, you're taking an entire verse of everyone's parts to, to edit that rather than just taking a kick drum section or whatever, because obviously it's not going to line up to a grid, right? Yeah, I just do edit everything together. And uh, and I wouldn't normally like if the guitar player said, oh, I played better on take four. Well, take four might not have been the same tempo. So then it's like then we start making decisions. All right, well, are you going to punch in or we just punch the whole band in? You know, it, it just, I just try and keep it as organic as possible. And sometimes a little surgery is required if everybody really wants to keep a take and something's funky, then, you know, I might have to grab a guitar from another take that might have been at a slightly different tempo and just fudge it around till it's tight. But I'd much rather do that than record everything to the grid, be detective, make it perfect, and then overdub each instrument perfectly tight because that does not make the song better. 
unfortunately, it's what everybody's used to now, everything being so perfect and so computer tight. But there's lots of bands that don't want that. And there's successful bands out there on the radio that absolutely have not done that. For sure. Yeah, it sort of sounds like in, in some ways it's almost like you're working with tape, but digital tape. You know, it's like you're, you're taking the same approach to how productions would have been done entirely in tape, but you're pr- applying it to a digital world. Um, but it's interesting that you bring up the kind of expectations that people have and how people are so used to hearing songs these days on the radio that have that ultra gridded, super sampled kind of sound. So how do you find like that balance for yourself? Like, do you care about it? Or is it just like, if you're working with Jay Russ and this is the sound you're going to get, this is how I do it. Kind of. I mean, I I'm open to doing stuff like that. If people ask me to, I don't think a band like say, Trivium or Spirit Box or Architects, they're not going to call me. I don't think so. Because I don't do what they're doing. So, and I've had bands call me to mix stuff that are, make that very super tight, you know, accurate sounding record. And it as hasn't always worked out. And I usually say to them, I don't know if I'm that guy. I'm more the Andy Wallace approach. I'm more organic. You know, I did some test mixing for Megadeth a few years ago. I knew I wasn't going to get the gig before I even mixed one note. I just didn't feel like I was the right guy for that record, even though I'd worked with Anthrax a lot, two very different bands. I did it anyway. It was fun. I enjoyed mixing a couple songs, talking to the band, became very friendly with David Ellison. He's a, he's a good pal of mine. So, you know, it just, it was what it was. It just, I knew I wasn't the right guy for that. And I test mix for a lot of different people. I don't do it so much anymore. Years ago, I did it a lot because you were trying to open doors and try and, you know, get in with bigger bands, of course. But rarely these days do I get asked to do a test mix. And if I do get asked, I usually say no, unless it's somebody that I really want to work with. But if it's a band I don't know that well, or just isn't, you know, at a level that, should be asking for a test mix. You know what I mean? Cause <laughs> sometimes a band that has nothing going on wants a test mix. I'm like, no, that's no thanks. You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you just want a free mix <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But sometimes they, they'll pay some labels offer to pay for test mixes. Fine. Okay. No problem. Of course. Well, yeah. And if, if it's a big act, then you kind of know, typically with a bigger act, you already kind of have a history of their track record and you know what, what it could lead to. So you know, maybe that's more of an incentive to do it, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking of mixes, I'm curious to know, like, what is your mindset when you start a mix? Like, where do you start? How do you start? What's your typical process there? I usually balance all the instruments with nothing going on, no compression, no EQ. I just balance the song, especially if it's something that I haven't produced. If somebody just sends me a multi-track, I just want to hear what's going on. I love a rough mix if they have one or a mix that a previous mixer or producer has done. Um, That's always really helpful, just to hear how they've been hearing it. So usually what I'll do is I'll just balance it best I can with nothing going on, and then I'll start putting it through my system. I have a Trident console. I have uh, some outboard gear, EQs, compression that I put on the stereo bus. I have a fairly hefty analog chain. And then everything else I just do in Pro Tools, individual EQ, individual compression. I make extensive subgroups of all the different instruments. I do extensive parallel compression. So basically, yeah, I just balance it as quickly as possible, which is, again, another Andy Wallace approach. I've read countless interviews with him where he's like, I get the mix going in 30 minutes quickly as possible just balance it make it sound like something then spend four to six to eight hours automating it making it special you know doing that kind of thing making sure that the song has energy and excitement absolutely well it's it's interesting that you said like you know try to get it going with levels first in that first half hour and i i think that that's so important to do because it's it's kind of like the gut mix, you know, it's like feeling it from the gut and, and just really reacting to the music and, and trying to make it feel like a song and not really usually that first half hour when you're doing those levels, you're not getting super technical and in the weeds and hyper analyzing everything. It's just it's more of a feeling thing with the songs at that point. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And especially if you don't know the material, you want to get familiar as you can with what's 
what's being played? Like, what did they find important? That's why the rough mix is so important too. Uh, I just mixed uh, another Swedish band. Hadn't worked with them before. They sent me a song. It had a hundred and something tracks, lots of keyboards. Thank God for the rough mix because they really favored a keyboard I didn't think was that interesting. But then in the end, when I hear it in the final mix, I'm like, oh, okay, now I get it. You know, that's that makes sense. So it's really important to listen to what they were listening to before they send it to you. Otherwise, you're just going to be chasing your tail and being they're going to be like, oh, no, this is all wrong. And, you know, that's not what we were looking for at all. Basically, what they want is their rough mix to sound better. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's kind of like how a lot of people approach mastering, too, right? It's like you just want that. To, you want your mix to sound better after it goes to a mastering engineer. <laughs> yeah, or or not. You know, if I'm super happy with a mix, I I dislike mastering greatly. You know, I, I think it's becoming an antiquated process, except for vinyl. And that's why I use Paul Logos, because he's the best. He can cut a lacquer. He can make it sound great. I know it's going to sound great. And, you know, vinyl these days, a lot of bands, they sell it because it's a it's a merch piece. They can make good money off of it. Half the time, if you press a vinyl record, it's the lacquer master's cut by a computer in Czech Republic. Like, it just... To have an actual person cut that lacquer and make sure it sounds good is really important to me, which is why I always use Paul. And I use him to master my records, too, because he's very old school, hands off. If the mix is great, he's just getting it slightly louder for me, maybe fixing a little EQ, making everything, making sure my mixes are all consistent, at least. And we have a very good relation, working relationship where I can, you know, if he masters the record, I'll be like, look, it's perfect, but do you mind if I send you a new mix on these three songs with the snare up a DB? He's like, yeah, go ahead, do it, you know? And, you know, I can't necessarily do that if a band goes to Sterling or goes to some of these places that, you know, overcharge you for mastering, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars to master a record. That's just ridiculous. Um, as far as, uh, again, going back to kind of just your approach when you're starting your mixes, do you ever work off templates or is it always kind of starting from the ground up? I have a template, which is basically just for my routing. Because my routing is so complicated, I sent, I basically create subgroups, drums, bass, guitars, secondary guitars, lead guitars, keyboards, vocals, background vocals, and then maybe miscellaneous. That all gets bussed through my console, through stereo pairs, out of the console into my um, Neve EQ, then into an SSL bus compressor, then back into Pro Tools. And then when it comes back in, I might do a little tiny slight bit of limiting, maybe a soft clip, you know, whatever, nothing too major. Um, and then all the subgroups that go out to my console, I have an EQ on each subgroup. If I want to just add top or bottom to the whole group or whatever, sometimes things need a bit of mid-range. I like to do a lot of overall EQ, overall massaging. I find the mix comes together a lot quicker because a lot of times if somebody's recorded a record in the same studio with the same mics and the same band, Everything has the same problem. There's a buildup at 250, there's not enough at 2 or 3K, or there's too much at 500. You know, it, it will tend to have that problem across every instrument, depending where they recorded. So having a good overall EQ on all your subgroups is very helpful. You can literally make a mix, a rough mix, sound like a record in minutes by just EQing everything together at once. It's very sort of another Andy Wallace trick, you know, just start compressing right away, EQ the whole mix right away, and you'd be surprised how quickly you're in the ballpark, you know? For sure. Yeah, it's like that that top-down approach that a lot of people talk about too, right? Like, do you ever do, you ever do any processing to, like, your master bus right away, or is it you kind of leave that untouched for the most part? My ba master bus is basically the SSL bus compressor and my Neve EQ, um, which is all analog. The Neve, I'm just boosting, like, couple dB at... 40 hertz and i'm boosting i have a shelf at around 8k a uh, couple db just to give top and bottom to everything in the analog world and then if i need more sculpting eq on the whole mix i'll do it to the subgroups that go out to the console so before it hits the console and before it hits the compressor and stereo eq i've tried other boxes i've tried like the ssl fusion um i have an old apex dominator just different things for different projects. Um, I thought the Fusion was a really cool box, but it just wasn't... 
I didn't need it. I have already have a fairly hefty analog chain, so I didn't need to add more grit to my already gritty <laughs> sort of chain. <laughs> Um, but yeah, as for as far as template, my template is just routing. So I know which instruments go to which buses, which buses go to which outputs on the console. I just saved myself a lot of time by just importing that template, at least for routing purposes. But you can't really template a mix much beyond that, in my opinion, because everything's so different. You know, I do. I use similar drum samples on records if they need samples, but I don't rely on samples the way a lot of modern records do, where it's almost all sample. I use as much of the live kit as possible, and then augment for punchiness and consistency. Really, since you do have the console, are you making like subgroups to fit your console? Like I know, like you, you, CLA always talks about how he always works off of whatever it is, forty-eight channels, and every mix is the same thing, right? Yeah, he's using the console to actually mix. Like, he's moving faders and using each channel and doing total recalls and stuff. I'm much more basic. I'm basically using stereo groups on the console. I'm not really using the EQ on the console. I'm just using it as, like, a giant busing system. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah, whereas all the other stuff you're doing is mainly in the box. So how long does it normally take you, then, to finish your mixes? It's weird. You know, I can pull a mix together in three or four hours now, which used to take me two or three days. I just, you know, it, years and years of experience builds confidence and knowing your room. That's why I've never changed rooms. I've never changed speakers. I just, once you get your system and you know what you're doing translates, then I don't mess with it, you know? And I've been mixing on Yamaha HS50s for probably at least 10 years, maybe more. Um, I've changed my secondary monitors seven or eight times. I just, I can never find a secondary monitor that's useful. Like if I had Genelex, oh, they're too bright, they're too boomy. I've had NS10s, they're too harsh, they're too thin, they're too papery, even though that's what I used for my first probably 10 years. I was only on NS10s, but I was used to them, you know? Yeah. Now when I listen to them, I'm just like, ah, shut those off, you know? Just <laughs> tear my face off. I do have a classic pair of NS10s, but I have them with a subwoofer. They so It sounds really good, you know? It's, it is what it is. Um, and I was using Yamaha HS7s, I was using HS80s, I had a pair of Kali in eights, which are really flat, like eight inch bigger secondary monitors. But now I'm using a pair, of, a brand new pair of Aventone Gauss sevens, um, which just came out and they're really fantastic speakers. Like I'm actually using them and I'll switch to them and I'll mix on them for half an hour and then switch back to the smaller Yamahas and everything's translating. I'm really happy and they're not expensive. They're like 700 bucks for a pair of power monitors ribbon tweeter they sound great yeah but it you know it makes sense what you said it's like once you know your system stick with it like why mess with it and have to relearn it every time right i kind of forget your original question i got off on a speaker tangent there but <laughs> well, what we're did just you ask? About, like just talking about how long it takes for you to finish a mix oh yeah so basically um now i can get a mix pre-happening in two or three hours but what i'll end up doing is then leaving it and i'll go do something else because i'm always working on multiple records so that is really helpful. Most people are like, oh, how can you mix? Because I was mixing like a blues trio and a metal record at the same time. And to me, it's actually really helpful because it just totally clears your head. So then I switched to the other record, mix for a few hours. I'm like, oh, okay, that. And you instantly know what's wrong with a mix when you've left it for even an hour or sometimes overnight. Then when I go back to the metal record, I'm like, okay, now I can really dig into this. The what I really, really like to do is spend two or three hours, really bang it out, get it as close as I can, and then just close it. Just get away from it, go do something else, or even just go to another song on that record and do the same thing. I like to basically build each song up to a point, to like a 60-70% mix point, then go to the next song, do the same thing, then go to the next song, do the same thing. Then when you circle back, most of the hard work's done. You've done all your routing, you've added your samples if need be, you figured out your effects, you've balanced it, it sounds really good. Well, now you have to dig in and automate it and make it sound like a record. Well, those hours you spent doing all that dirty work, that messes with your hearing, it messes with your objectivity. You're never going to... I'm not that person that can just open a mix, start it, and finish it the same day. I'm not Lord Algae. I know he can do that two or three times in a day. It's just That's just not me. 
So I like to break it up and circle back constantly. Yeah. And then is automation your last step in your process? Um, I start automating as quickly as I can because I find once I do, the mix just starts coming together a lot faster. Gotcha. And what are some of the typical automation moves that you find yourself doing? Um, boosting guitars and choruses, even boosting the whole mix in a chorus if it doesn't, if the dynamics aren't built the way I want them to be, or or lowering a verse as opposed to boosting the chorus. Um, vocal rides, lots of vocal rides. I want every word to be heard. I mean, obviously, if you're doing extreme compression, which we would often do in hard rock and metal vocal rides are less <laughs> required because every word's about the same volume by the time you're done. But yeah, a lot of that, um, you know, just creating dynamics really, if it doesn't exist. For sure. It's interesting that you were talking about vocals and how heavily you compress things. Like uh, it sounds like that's, I know a lot of the guys in the rock scene tend to do that, you know, slam, slam the crap out of a vocal and it just, you know, has its own place. Um, so do you find that like, in general, you feel like you go heavy on the compression and then you build in those dynamics with automation or do you try to preserve some of those dynamics a little bit more naturally in the mix? And I think vocal dynamics still come through even with heavy compression. And sometimes the compression is what creates the dynamic because if you have a singer that's somewhat linear, over compressing them can actually bring out the l really subtle moves they're doing vocally. Um, so... More or less dynamically, I'm, I'm building that musically and letting the vocal be that one consistent same volume. I mean, I always look back at Oasis Wonderwall. When that vocal comes in after that acoustic intro, it's like a punch in the face. But when the band starts, he's sitting perfectly on top of the mix. Well, basically what they did was they set the vocal for when the band is playing and left it for the beginning, whereas 99% of the mixers out there would have turned that intro vocal down 2 dB, and then when the drum fill came in in the band, vocal comes back up. We all do it. Well, they just said, no, fuck that. It's going to be as loud <laughs> as it is the whole song. So next time you hear that song, you know, make sure your speaker isn't too loud because it, that vocal <laughs> will literally punch you in the face. But for it's sure. brilliant. It's, it worked for them, obviously. For sure. Yeah, I think people can perceive dynamics, especially with vocals, very easily because, you know, we we know if we hear like a whisper that it's a whisper. You know, we like there's like that impression that it's it's generally a quieter sound, even if like volume wise, it's just as loud as a scream later on in the, in the track. Right. It's like people kind of know our our dynamics in our own vocals and, and we kind of just perceive that that way, of too. Course. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's why I don't, you know, I rarely have to create vocal dynamics. That just sort of happens even with extreme compression. Yeah, for sure. So then how do you know when you're done with the mix? That's tough. You know, I used to always do the car listen. I would sort of agonize over it that way. But these days I'm more like headphone, you know, Apple earbuds. I have a pair of Grado headphones. I have a pair of Yamaha headphones. So many people are listening to music on headphones, and especially in-ear type headphones. So I have two or three different pairs of in-ear type headphones. I have two or three over-ear headphones. I have the, the big Apple Air Max, whatever they're called, um, which are too bassy and a little warm, but at least you know I know what they sound like. Um, basically, that's it. Like If I listen to it and I'm walking down the street or just sitting on my couch with headphones and I don't hate it, then I guess I'm done. <laughs> or if the band is like, yeah, it sounds great. You know, we don't have any more notes. It's, I really rely on my artists too. You know, I want to, I want them to love it too. Absolutely. So do you find that you're, you get yourself to a point where you're like, I'm pretty happy with this. And then you'll just send it to the artist at that point to see what their thoughts are. Yeah. I'll usually send it to them earlier than I should. Like I'll send it is more of a rough mix. Even if it's 80% done, I'll just say, hey, look, this is basically a rough mix. A real mix, but it's not done. Here's the direction. Do you like it? And that's a good way to start because if you put too much time and energy into it and something's really wrong or not balanced the way they hear it, it's better to find out sooner than later. And especially if you pr approach it as this is still rough, then in their mind, at least they know you're not done. Like... Nothing worse than you saying, all right, I finished the mix. I love it. You better like it. You know, that I don't have that <laughs> attitude. I'd rather say, look, I like this. It's good, but I don't consider it done. What do you think? You know, like, let's let's work on this together. 
for sure. And sometimes that last 20% will take you just as long as the first 80%, you know, like that's when or you can longer. get really, yeah, you can get really granular with it. And yeah, you might have completely, you know, missed the point with that, with the mix as it is. And then, you know, the band will ask you to change a lot of different things and you're starting over again at that point, right? Sure. And it's artist dependent too, you know, some aren't worried about the final mix. They just trust me and they know what they wanted to do, which was either get a great vocal or get a great performance. Once they get that, some artists just check out. They're like, no, I trust you. Do your thing. You know, you know what the record should sound like. And then I have other artists that are very involved right to the final, right? Last second of mastering, you name it. Yeah. Right on. Well, Jay, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. If, if, uh, if people want to learn more about you and maybe follow you online or potentially even work with you, like what, what are the best places for them to look to, to find more about you? Well, I have my website, which is just my name, jrustin.com. Uh, my, my email address is on there. My manager's address is on there. My discography. Um, I'm on all the social media platforms as well. You know, people follow me on there. I get messages from bands on there sometimes wanting to, you know, me to listen to their stuff, which I always encourage. I love finding new music. So yeah, that's, I'm, I'm pretty reachable in general on either through email or on my social media. Awesome. And last question, are there any cool projects that you're currently working on that you might be able to talk about? Well, I just finished uh, mixing a record for the Winery Dogs. I finished mixing uh, Steel Panther. I produced and mixed the new Avatar record, which will be out next year. Hopefully we'll get a song this fall. I don't know the release schedule on that quite yet. Um, I also mixed a couple pop records. I did a record with Matt Goss, who's a British uh, pop singer. And I'm about to start a record with Air Supply, huge 70s, you know, kind of pop rock band. So I, again, you know, just keeping it diverse. <laughs> Love it. It brings a full circle. Well, thank you again for taking the time to do this. Definitely, I think, lots of great great advice here and lots of uh, great lessons for people to learn. And, you know, listening to, uh, listening to your approach, it definitely reminds me in a lot of ways of some of the stuff that I definitely learned from Jack Richardson. So I can, I can tell that you learned from him as well. So very, very cool to hear that. So that was my interview with Jay Rustin. And I thought that was really interesting. I love his approach to working with bands and trying to preserve their natural feel and how he likes to go about tempo mapping everything. I think that's a really th important thing that a lot of people overlook. A lot of people will just think, well, I'll just record a band live off the floor, no click track. But then you can run into issues with overdubs and adding synth tracks and MIDI and all sorts of stuff afterwards. And Jay's approach of tempo mapping is definitely an important factor in being able to make it all work after the fact and being able to make the process a lot easier. So that's definitely a big takeaway that I think a lot of you guys should take if you are recording bands and doing live off the floor recordings that don't have click tracks to them. Um, another thing I really loved hearing was his approach to vocals and, you know, just the concept of really compressing vocals, because I think that that's something that a lot of people shy away from. A lot of people kind of hear these rules, and I say that in air quotes because they're totally false, which is that when you're compressing, you should never compress more than 2 to 3 dB, that kind of thing. And because of that, people end up having a hard time getting their vocals to sit on top of the mix. But as Jay was saying in this interview, sometimes you need that heavy compression, and that can really make the vocals sit on top of the mix and give it a lot of clarity overall. So definitely make sure to implement that into your mixes if you're working on heavier rock stuff and you're struggling to get your vocals to stand out. So yeah, I just thought, you know, learning his process there was really cool. And it was also really interesting to hear that he learned from Jack Richardson, who was one of my early mentors. And, you know, after hearing Jay's process here, I definitely can hear a lot of those uh, influences from Jack in there too. So that was definitely cool to hear as well. Uh, I love Jack. Jack was such a great mentor and uh, unfortunately he passed away, but he definitely passed on a lot of lessons to a lot of great engineers in the industry. But yeah, that is it for this episode with Jay. I hope that you enjoyed that. If you did, definitely make sure to subscribe to the podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live. And as I always remind you on every episode, definitely make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is where I help out musicians with creating pro sounding recordings from their home studios. And on the website, there's tons of great resources designed to help you make the process of recording, editing, and mixing your music very easy. And you're definitely going to want to check out my book while you're there. It's called The Mixing Mindset. And inside of that book, I break down the entire process of mixing your music step by step so you know exactly what to listen for, what to do, what order to work in, that way you have all of the clarity that you need so that you're not guessing at what to do. Instead, it's going to keep you focused and give you a very clear path to follow when it comes to making your mixes sound just as good as your favorite recordings. So once again, check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset, and that's available at MasterYourMix.com. So we've reached the end of the episode. Looking forward to chatting with you in the next one.
We'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com. Thank you.